king, fellow believers in him. What are they wearing? was the question he heard when he stepped in the house. She had to work that day and was unable to attend the wedding worship service, but they were both looking forward to the wedding reception. What an honor to be invited. The answer to her question set the gears in motion for her preparation. First, she had to touch up her nails. While they dried, she picked out what to wear. The outfit, the shoes, the jewelry, the wrap. Next came her hair, which had to be just so because there was no way she was going to be seen in public on a bad hair day. Then came the makeup, a stroke of concealer under each eye to cover the dark circles, and the foundation layer, or as guys would call it, the spackling compound and primer to fill in the cracks and get ready for painting. Then came the eyeliner, the eye shadows, plural, the mascara. The eyebrow pencil arced its path, and a touch of blush was blended in over the cheekbones. She finished getting dressed, and last but not least, leaned into the mirror to lacquer on a line of lipstick. All of this was absolutely essential to get ready for the wedding reception. But none of that would have happened if it hadn't been for the trigger. And the trigger was the first question she had asked before leaving for work that morning. When? When does the cocktail hour start? When are they serving the dinner? When should we leave to get in the car? In time for the cocktail hour or in time just to get there to grab our place cards and be seated? When? Once the time for the wedding reception and leaving the house were established, then she could set in motion her getting ready. To get ready for a wedding reception, you have to know when first, and then you have to know how. During the Advent season of the church year, our focus is both near and far. Near, we're looking to Jesus' first coming. Far, we look to his second coming because what he did in his first coming made it possible for his return to be the beginning of an eternal wedding reception at which he is the groom and we are the bride. In today's gospel account from Matthew chapter 24, Jesus calls out to you and to me, be ready. And then he teaches us when and how. Jesus' close followers probably fladubered their words when they were about to ask their question because their question seemed like it might be out of place. After all, they had heard him predict on at least three occasions that he was going to Jerusalem and there he was going to die. Now, on all of Monday and all of Tuesday, they had witnessed the anger meter of Jesus' enemies reach the red zone and level off there. They saw blood in the eyes of all who wanted him dead. Having cut through the madding crowd late that afternoon, they wound their way up the path, back and forth between the olive trees that led up the ridge east of the city. They got to the top of that ridge, sat down with Jesus, and then they couldn't hold it in any longer. When? When will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Lord Jesus, we know that there is danger and death in that city awaiting you. We try to talk you out of it, but you would have none of it. 
because you seem so determined to do whatever it is you're going to do. But when, Lord? When will this all end? When will you dominate those bad guys and give them what they deserve? When will you flex your muscles and exercise your power and get us out of this mess? When? Jesus certainly gave them signs that he would one day return in power and glory. Billboards that God posted along history's highway. Billboards like disease and disaster, wars and rumors of wars, false teaching. All these billboards that God would post on history's highway to indicate to all people that the end was going to come eventually, that this world is not our permanent home. But when? When would that happen? Jesus said, about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. No one will know when Jesus comes in glory at the end. Not the angels. Not even the Son, he says. Doesn't that seem a little strange? How could Jesus not know the time and day for the end, for judgment day? When he is God, how could he not know? Well, we have here, my friends, two marvelous truths of Scripture all wrapped up in these little passages. The first is the marvel of the nature of our God. That he is three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, yet one God. How can that be? I can't understand. You can't understand, but it's true. And the second marvel is the person of Jesus, that he is both God and man at the same time. He was, is, and always will be fully God, backward and forward in time. But while on earth, in his ministry, he chose to keep his power under wraps for a time. That started when he was born. He is God, yet lying in a manger. He made all food, yet needed food. He never rests, but needed rest. He lives forever and ever, but died on a cross. It seems like a puzzle at first, doesn't it? But it really isn't. It's simply a truth of Scripture that is presented as a fact so that we know and understand who Jesus is, God and man, at the same time. Why he had to be God and man is the most important. He did it. Because only perfect people get to enter the eternal wedding reception. And we're not perfect. So he took on human flesh, stepped into our shoes to do what we can't do. He also did it because people who aren't perfect get thrown out of the eternal wedding reception. Not only that, they are supposed to pay for their failures. So he took on human flesh, stepped into our shoes to do what we don't want to do. All of this. It's just wrapped up neatly in this little phrase, about that day, no one knows, not even the Son. During his earthly ministry, Jesus certainly did know. As true God, he did know the time and day of judgment, but he chose to keep that knowledge under wraps. So as he's talking to his disciples up on this ridge known for its olive trees, Late on that Tuesday evening, just three days before he's about to die, the ultimate example of him as God having his power under wraps, he spoke to them about not knowing in his not making full use of power mode. And it had to happen that way. Or they and we would be toast. You see, this is now the Advent season of the church here. We've entered that today. Advent's a time in which we get ready to celebrate Christmas. Why do we get ready? Some would say, well, we're celebrating Jesus' birthday, and if you're going to have a party, you have to get ready. No way would you invite anybody over to your house unless you would first clean the house, shovel the sidewalks, and get the food ready. But that's actually not the real reason why we celebrate Christmas. The real reason why we get ready to celebrate isn't to have a happy birthday party for Jesus. It's to remember who he is and why he came the first time. You see, he could have entered our world and condemned us. 
He could have exercised and shown all of his holy power and glory and confronted us. I know what you're like. I know that you have lustful thoughts going through your mind once in a while and you blow it off like, well, everybody does that. I know that you too often have offered a pittance of your income. I know that your offerings are too often sporadic and not regular. I know that you look at some people lower than yourself and judge them lovelessly. You ought to be condemned because God does that to sinners. He expects sinners not to be sinners, but if they are, he will punish them. But then Jesus says, that's why I came into the world in the first place, to rescue you from all of that. And this is why we celebrate Advent and do our Advent preparing. We prepare to celebrate the birth of a Savior a savior from sin who has entered our world and, and we have a target date in mind. Centuries ago, the Christian church established December 25 as the day we'll celebrate that. So, we've got 24 shopping days left. There are that many days to clean the house, that many days to bake the cookies, that many days to make our travel plans, that many days or hours or minutes to fly or drive wherever we want to go. But when it comes to his second coming, he does not set a target date. Why not? Because if he did, most people would sin like crazy and then just clean up their act at the last minute. And God does not want us to behave like that. He wants us always to be ready for his coming in glory. To underscore that, Jesus used some illustrations. He said it's like his second coming will be like some guys working out in a field and hoeing away in the dirt, and all of a sudden one guy turns to the other and his friend is gone. Or two ladies are using hand grain grinders, grinding grain between slabs of stone. They're chatting about the weather and about their kids. And one looks over at the other, and she's gone. That fast and that unexpected will be Jesus' return at the end in glory. And another illustration. He said, if a thief met you at Grace Place Coffee Shop today and said, I'm coming over tonight about 2.30 to take all your stuff, you would do everything to prevent that from happening. The point is clear. We don't know when Jesus will return in glory. We don't know when. Therefore, Jesus said, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. The disciples' question about when had wrapped into it their second question, how? How do we get ready? Jesus answered them with a historical reference. A little tidbit from history. Taking them way back in time to the time of the flood. Here's what he said. In the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Anything wrong with that stuff? Anything wrong with eating, drinking, being given in marriage, giving in marriage? Anything wrong with that? No, but there is an edge in this scene from the flood account. Can you picture it? There's Noah up on his ladder on the side of this big ark, plastering away the walls of that big barge. And he peeks over his shoulder to see one of his neighbors down below who's standing there, chomping on a turkey drumstick with a smirk on his face. Pfft, Noah. <laughs> and there he sees another one of his neighbors who's munching on jalapeno crunchers. And you know what that's like when you munch on jalapeno crunchers. It's so loud you can't hear somebody talk. You've got to turn the TV volume up. So there's his other neighbor down there with cruncher chips in his November beard, and he's looking up, he's, what's that you say, Noah? Can't hear you. Who wants to listen to you anyway, Noah? Crackpot building a big barge out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> what's that you say, Noah? God's going to come and destroy the world? Oh, that's, that's, no way. I just 
bought a new house. In fact, we're planning our wedding reception. We had all kinds of problems changing caterers. I finally put down a down payment. We're ready to go for the wedding reception. You say that God's going to destroy the world, my house, the wedding reception place, too? Oh, my friends and relatives won't believe that, neither will I. We couldn't offer them a crummy wedding reception. That would be just the worst that could ever happen in anybody's life. Stop your talk about global flood, Noah. Then what happened? Boom! The heavens exploded and the earth erupted with water. And Jesus said, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. So how do we get ready for Jesus coming in glory on the last day? Drop the attitude. Watch for the signs and read the signs for what they are. If you saw a sign, lane closed 1,500 feet, and ignored it, you'd be hitting some orange cones. If you saw a red light and ignored it, you'd probably cause an accident. Why would anybody do that? Why did the people before the flood ignore Noah's warnings and all the signs of the flood? Pure and simple, unbelief. So how do we get ready for Jesus coming when we don't know when it will be? How do we get ready? Pure and simple, belief, faith, believing. But believing what? Believe that you can save yourself? Believe that God doesn't care if we keep some of his commands and ignore a few others? Believe that God really doesn't provide for us all that well while we live here in this world? No. Believe that God is serious about your sin and mine. Even one minor infraction, one tiny little boo-boo, one caustic comment about someone whispered even while you're at church is a big deal to God. And he will damn people if they still have sin on their count when Jesus returns. Believe that you are a sinner and need God's rescue. But then also believe that's why Jesus came the first time, to rescue you. Believe that he's your only help, your only hope, your only escape for the flood of God, from the flood of God's anger and from being thrown out of the eternal wedding reception to be exposed to hell's desert heat with an eternally starving soul and eternally parched tongue. Believe that Jesus is the divine, the divine makeup artist who's covered your blemishes of sin, who's masked your scars of guilt, and who's robed you with the pure white robe of his love washed in his blood. That's how to get ready. We enter a new church here today, the Advent season. And as we do, we're getting ready to celebrate Jesus' first coming. We look forward to his second coming. And two questions are on our mind, when and how? To find the answers, look to Jesus, listen to him, pay attention to what he says, and notice how his apostle wraps it all up. You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While well, people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. That's how we get ready. Somewhere along the line, if you've hung around downtown Milwaukee, you've either seen a guy driving by or standing out in a corner with a sign that says, The end is near! Get ready! I think he's doing that as scare tactics, but I don't think scaring people is going to get them into heaven. Based on what Jesus teaches us here in this gospel account, you actually now can respond to someone like that. You know what to say. Scare tactics don't work on me. They might work on some people, but not on me. 
because I'm looking forward to celebrate Jesus' first coming. I know why he came. And I'm also looking forward to celebrating his second coming because it won't be the end. It will be the beginning of an eternal wedding reception in which he is the groom and I am the bride. And because of what he did for me, I'm dressed and ready to go. Amen.